Then I also created this compatibility matrix where I make some suggestions what happens when you're together with a person who's not at your level of development. So, but coming back to this one, to look at your highest relationship potential that you have from your highest level of development that you can feel into right now or that you experience in each of the quadrants. You know, what is the future of relationship? Where are you now? And what are your potentials? And look at each quadrant. So in an integral relationship, you really focus on health in each of the four quadrants and not only in one or two or three. One more thought is we experience the relationship mainly, of course, in the upper quadrants, but the actual relationship itself happens in the lower quadrants. And there is a great thing from uh, Sternberg, the, the Triangle of Love, and that basically looks at the interior intimacy, right, rapport side, and the exterior physical passion, the hormones, all, all of these things, sexual attraction, right? So, and if we chart the, the intensity of the intimacy and the intensity of the passion, the sexual passion, we get two lines that can form two sides of a, of a triangle. Does that make sense? And of course, if these sides are not equal, then the relationship is somewhat out of balance. And then there, there is the bottom side of the triangle, and does anybody know what that is? That's, that's the unconscious. And some people say 80% of the attraction that we experience to someone is unconscious. So Keith will talk a little bit about that. And so if your triangle looks like this or this, that, that really looks painful, right? If you're with somebody where your triangles of love are not aligned, ouch, right? And if it's aligned, then that's wonderful. And so in here is the triangle, and if we have only, I mean, if they're all zero, these lines, then we have basically no love. If we only have intimacy, then we get friendship. If we only have passion, we get infatuation. If we only have this unconscious dependence, then I think Roger Walsh stole that from me to say, to listen to love songs and to hear, because I say that always in my workshops, listen to love songs, they mainly uh, talk or sing about this unconscious dependence, right? If you leave me now, they take away the biggest part of me, and so on and so forth. And then when you get combinations, intimacy and passion, you get romantic love. If you get infatuation and dependence, you get crazy love, or you're crazy about each other, and everybody else thinks you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> then you get uh, intimacy and dependence, but no sex. That would be companionate love, or sometimes called marriage. Doesn't have to be that. <laughs> cheap job. Cheap job. Yeah. Disagree. <laughs> I agree also. But it gives me good <laughs> anyway. And then if we have all three sides uh, in a healthy way developed, we get what I would suggest we can call integral love. And I hope that more and more people will co-create these integral relationships and co-create uh, a sustainable and peaceful future. Right? This is like the overall theme here, and I think it starts in our relationships. And I'd like to talk about the unconscious and whatever else. Yes. Okay. One, uh, when I'm talking to single people of any age, I want to help them train their nervous systems to discern people that are likely to be good partners for them, and I want them to unconsciously be interested in being a good partner. And so the best that I've been able to come up with this is I teach people to ask themselves five questions about other people. Of course, I don't have PowerPoint slides, so I have to tell you what you're <laughs> Okay, and what, what I, my, my goal here is our brains work in a particular kind of way. You know, we associate on um, the world, instantiate states of consciousness, and each one of those states of consciousness has a story. And then that story drives our behavior. And there's a big story in our life, our autobiographical narrative, and that changes as we grow. And when we get to the second tier, we can actually look back and see the previous stories. They can become objects. But in the first tier, they don't. We change our stories, but don't know that we change our stories which is fine. So how, how can we adjust our stories? How can we accelerate that? Well, one thing I ask people to do is spend about a month asking yourself these five questions about everybody you see. And the first question is, is there erotic polarity? Is there a little spark, central spark, between me and this other person? Because if you're going to get in a relationship with somebody, it has to have some sexual spark. Okay. The second question you ask yourself is, does this person take care of their physical or psychological health? Now, when we look at another person, we get 
astounding amounts of information about them, looking into their face, looking at their body. Now, they can hide a lot of stuff, too, but we get an astounding amount of information. Does this person take care of their physical and psychological health? I call these the five stars. The third question is, if I was in relationship with this person, we had conflict, would they be able and willing to do what it takes to get back to love? Able and willing to do what it takes to get back to love. And the fourth one is, would this person be a superior? Oh, I'm sorry. Say it one more time. Able and willing. If I was in a relationship and there was conflict, would they be able and willing to get back to love? Able and willing. Not just able, but willing. The fourth one is, would this person be a superior parent? Not an okay parent. Not a fine parent. Superior. Because, you know, you have a kid with somebody, you don't want just an okay parent as your partner. You want a superior parent. It's a big deal. You know, I tell this to 15-year-olds. See, why, why the fuck should I care about whether someone's a parent? I say, you know, I want you to practice affiliation. And if you practice affiliating with people that aren't good parents, you're going to have a lot of pain. And I don't want you to have that pain. I want you to have joy and love. And the fifth one is, does this person have a deep sense of purpose? It's connected to God, their spirituality, a deep sense of purpose. And do they see and appreciate, even admire, my deep purpose? The answer to one, so you ask yourself these questions consciously. After a while, you do it for a month. You pull up next to somebody in, uh, on, the, on the street, you look around, oh, that person would be a superior parent. I mean, it, it's like looking at somebody's, oh, hey, I have erotic polarity, but we all go to sad. No, that person would be able to really you would be able and willing to get back to love if we were in conflict. I can tell that just from seeing it. And I'm pretty sensitive here, but we can train our nervous systems. Now, my stealth agenda, of course, with this, i got a lot of stealth agendas, apparently. My stealth agenda with this is that as you look at these things with other people, you're also examining them in yourself. And you want to grow in that direction and be more that five-star person in yourself. And this is how we operationalize horizontal and vertical development. So that's one big deal. I wanted to share that with you, my clients, and a lot of people I've taught have found that ridiculously useful. And this is something that's integrally informed, and it's, it's widely applicable. And the last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm, I'm sure, sorry I'm in a short period of time because it's a big deal. You know, any one of these relationship books that we all read or we heard about, if you follow everything in that relationship book, you can have a great relationship. Two people do that. But, you know, that doesn't ever happen. I mean, I know. I've written relationship books. Nobody's ever taken one of my books. It's Tune Family. Nobody's ever taken that and says, yeah, we live by the Tune Family principles and we're blissful. <laughs> why, why is that? The reason for that is when we hit the intimate bonding stage of relationship, when we recapitulate the levels of intimacy we had in our, in our families of origin, the defensive states from that family of origin, they come up in that relationship. And they come up fast. And we have challenges as the erotic polarity diminishes uh, out of romantic infatuation. So on one hand, you, you serve that by being aware of all those channels and being aware of them and working on them. But then the other part of it, the shadow part of it, is a big deal. The shadow part of it is when I feel threatened, I enter a defensive state. And I do it quick. I mentioned it in my talk because it's such a big deal. And that defensive state involves amplified or numbed emotions, distorted perspectives, destructive impulses, and, and diminished capacities for empathy and self-reflection. In other words, if I'm having a fight with my wife, I enter a state where I'm, I'm threatened. You know, she's threatening me by fighting with me. My anger gets amplified. Okay? My perspective about her gets distorted. I have a distorted negative story about her. I have a destructive impulse. I want to tell her she's full of it. And my, my capacities for empathy and self-reflection are shut down. Those areas of my frontal cortex literally are shut down. This is what happens. This is necessary from an evolutionary standpoint because when we're threatened, we might have to do violence to another person because we grew up, we evolved the last several million years, mostly where our biggest threat were other people. So in our social environment, we're acutely, exquisitely uh, attuned to potential threat which involves a lot of sensitivity to approval and disapproval, by the way. So a little bit of disapproval goes a long way in a relationship. Could you repeat those five things? Amplified emotions. Amplified or numbed emotions. Yeah. Distorted perspectives. Destructive impulses. 
and reduced capacity for empathy and self-reflection. Now, one of the biggest characteristics of successful long-term couples, John Gottman studied these couples. You know, people who say, yeah, we're, we're happy with each other in 30 years, 40 years, 20 years, is they receive influence from each other. And especially the guy receives influence from the woman. You know, you know that's kind of asymmetrical. Why, why, why should that matter more? It does for a variety of reasons, which I don't have time to get into. But receiving influence is a big deal. So we have an integral map. If we're generally in the same inner country from an integral perspective, how we grow will depend on how we receive influence from each other. If I receive influence from my partner to be a better guy, and she receives influence from me to be a better woman, that relationship has huge, huge boost compared to all other relationships. And we can consciously decide to do that. And we should consciously decide to do that. And I am unabashedly uh, an advocate for that and do everything that I can when I'm working with individuals and couples to do that. To offer loving influence, receive loving influence. And part of that involves these defensive states because I can see my defensive states on your face. Because if I'm walking around and all of a sudden there's something, something uh, defensive state happening with you and me, you're going to shut down. And I'm going to want to make it about you. Right? Yes? No? Right. Okay, so everybody for a moment, think about the last time you had some nasty fight with somebody or some argument or something. Just think about it for just a moment. You know, this is one of these happy exercises. <laughs> this is a bummed out exercise for a moment. I'm sorry we have to end it. <laughs> get us up before we stop, okay? Okay, so think about that. Okay, you have a negative story about that other person, right? But, but what was going on in you? What's your amplified emotion? What's your distorted perspective? Notice you not looking at yourself for that, looking at, and not being empathetic, empathic with them. Notice your destructive impulse to tell them how wrong they are. Now, if you can, and those, these states accelerate fast, really fast. They, they take 40, 50 milliseconds. If we generally don't pay attention to them because we're ashamed of them. 10 seconds later, twice as big, a minute later, you know, at a certain point, you pass a threshold and you can't regulate it. So you want to catch it really fast. And you want to go, I'm in a defensive state, and what I need to do, I need to not trust what I'm thinking. I need to not trust the story I'm telling myself. I need to reach for compassion. And that's why evolution takes us to our deeper consciousness and more compassion. So go back into that argument that you had, that you were remembering, and have compassionate understanding of you and that other person. Just do that for about 15 seconds. You're in the argument, and you're cultivating compassionate understanding of me and of them, them, him or her. Just do it. Compassionate understanding. Now, what happens when you do that? Somebody. Yes, Michelle. I have, I have tears. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, they weren't there at that argument, but they could have been there. You know, they could be there the next time you have an argument, you can remember this moment. And you get, you know, I have this great story about how you're such an asshole, but you know what? That's probably a completely false story, and there's a compassionate one that's a better story. And I'm going to reach for that. Now, if we do that, that's shadow work. That's shadow work on the street. That shadow work in the kitchen. That shadow work in the bedroom. That shadow work on the toilet. That shadow work in the shower. So let's all do that. Let's all embody that. Because these defensive states don't stop. You know, I have people come in and teal sometimes. Not often, you know, but 6%. But sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter what, what your address is. You enter these defensive states, and if you're not aware of them, you go into these, you get lost in these stories, and if you are aware of them, then you adjust. And if you have two people doing this with each other, that's what creates the great relationships. That's the future of relationships. That's what takes us up the spiral. And that's what we all want to do. And that's the last thing I'm going to say today. Thank you.